Hello, hello, hello. Um, welcome back to the Brain Trust for episode 70, uh, Space and Technology on a Saturday night. I got my co-host with me, uh, Into Gravity, Dollar Will, and Jack. Say hello, brothers. Hello, he- hello, brothers. <laughs> hello, family. Here's what's going on. So what do we got for tonight, Mike? So we got uh, first on the docket, um, article from Engadget, U.S. Department of Transportation updates autonomous car rules. It will now allow, it will now acknowledge that driver can refer to automated status. Something, this is something new. I'm I'm pretty sure they're going to update more as they go along. Article is by Mallory Locklear. The U.S. Department of Transportation has released its latest set of voluntary guidelines for automated driving vehicles. A report that builds on previous versions released over the past two years with preparing for, with preparing for the future of transportation, automated vehicles 3.0. For those who don't understand, um, the white paper that is written for uh, autonomous vehicles um, by the Department of Transportation is an ongoing thing. It's never static. So they constantly update these rules um, every quarter or, or every every time they meet um, to pass new um, pass new standards and statutes per state and, and, um, and per region. The DOT outlines additional safety principles, updates, policy, and offering guidance to state and local governments. The integration of uh, autonomy, the integration of automation across our transportation system has the potential to increase product productivity and facilitate freight movement, said DOT Secretary Elaine Chow. But most importantly, automation has the potential to impact safety significantly by reducing crashes caused by human error, including crashes involving impaired or distracted drivers and saving lives. Oh, wait a second. I'm not even uh, sharing my screen. And uh, the current, oh, go ahead, Mike. I mean, uh, yeah, I was just going to say, if we ever forget to put the article up, because we're going to do that from time to time, you can always find it at the bottom of the video in the comments section. Uh, I was going to ask, the current head of the the Department of Transportation is Elaine Chow, right? Um, The the wife of uh, Mitch McConnell. Correct. Okay. So, you, you know, what, what what do you think is her positions on um, any of this? Because she doesn't, I haven't seen any public appearances that she's made other than, uh, I think, a couple of cabinet level uh, meetings in the White House. So it's unclear exactly what our stances on any of these are. At least, at least I don't know. Uh, my, my, my understanding of this is she, uh, she gets told what to do and that's it. Okay, interesting. Um, the report the report notes that it, it's meant to be an update, but not a replacement of last year's guidance, and it encourages those developing automated driving systems to make public their voluntary safety self assessments, which were introduced in the last year's report. It also updates a list of best practices for state and local governments considering auto- automated vehicle testing and operation. The agency also takes measures to clarify its policies and roles in regards to autonomous ve- autonomous technology implementation. First, it's doing away with the uh, automated vehicle proving grounds announced last year. A list of 10 self-driving test sites that were eligible for federal funding. The DOT said that due to the rapid increase in automated vehicle testing activities in many locations, there is no need for U.S. DOT to favor particular locations. Um, this is this is going to be a pretty much um, a coast to coast non non regional favored um, uh, update. So no no I mean, reason to uh, favor California or Arizona 
versus uh, New York and uh, in Massachusetts or anything like that. It sounds like like she's saying that that the uh, the development is going it's gotten ahead of their policy that I guess companies have created their own uh, testing sites. I mean, right. That, so what could, yeah, right. So what couldn't be done in California, you know, was taken taken on in um, in Arizona or New Mexico because there's so much free land and things like that to, for them to uh, operate under. Whereas in California, you know, you get you kind of have to go through some red tape. Cool. Carry yeah, on. I, think, I think it's kind. Of, I think it's kind of interesting because uh, it's like oh, you finishing an article. Yeah, I just need. I just want to finish that last paragraph. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Autonomous vehicle safety was put under the spotlight earlier this year when a self-driving Uber vehicle struck and killed a pedestrian. The public, the public has legitimate concerns about safety, security, and privacy of automated technology. Chow said in the report. But some argue that the DOT's approach to autonomous vehicle safety isn't enough. Despite deaths, despite despite deaths, injuries, crash, and crashes involving a variety of semi-autonomous and autonomous vehicle technology across the country, DOT continues to insist that eliminating regulation is the way to achieve safety. The center, the center of auto safety, said in, in the statement. About the report, the potential for safety advancement, advancement, advancements, or deadly disasters presented by autonomous vehicle technology is huge. Unfortunately, once again, uh, the National Highway Transportation and Safety um, is coming up small. Uh, what it just sounds like to me is that they're they they want to go they want to do away with the standards um, and just go straight ahead and let and let and let the cars basically. Um, not, not so much as run amok, but uh, to let them play out on their own, right? It, it, what kind of standards could you actually put, put in place uh, that that doesn't interfere with the development of the of the technology itself? Um, I hear you, but it also sounds. I mean, we talk, you know, it's politics, and, and once you have once once that vehicle struck a passenger. You, nobody's going to want to be on the side or, or, or seem like they're leading the charge. Nobody wants to lead the charge for autonomous vehicles because it already looks like we're moving too fast because the we, we shouldn't have... Uh, it's just unfortunate that we had an accident, a, a, a death, this early. So given that, the next thing, the best next best thing is to posture... Uh, on the side of being cautious, and so nobody's gonna want to be the first to come out in in the in the political spectrum to to, to to cheerlead for this right now. I think it's the kind of thing, one of those things that time is gonna um, work to bring this about. It's better to sit back and let some time go by. So at least it looks looks like you know some they were being cautious. They were taking additional measures, but it's kind of early after a major um, faux pas like that or death. <laughs> Which is- well, keep in mind that this keep keep in mind that this accident happened because some a, a pedestrian actually got in front of the vehicle and not so much that the vehicle ran off the side of the road. Um, the person was actually intoxicated, from my understanding, and got in front of the um, the, the uh, Waymo vehicle and uh, and, and it actually. Um, the Waymo vehicle um, didn't have enough time to stop. But that could just as easily have been a jaywalker. It could, and you know, people people jaywalk all the time. People walk in the street instead of on the sidewalk. And so we need smart technology to understand that people are not so smart. Well, see, my, my pushback on that is that in Europe, they don't really have this problem, right? I don't know if, you, if you've ever been to Europe, you'll see no. like how people obey traffic laws right so they don't jaywalk in europe they you know they wait for the uh crossing to uh you know allow them to go and then they go like that's just their culture out there but in the right. united states people just walk all over the streets and stuff like that so you're you're trying to prevent um a vehicle from watching other people mess up but at the same time people are actually breaking the law so there has to be if you have an autonomous vehicle with nobody inside of it 
and it hits a pedestrian because the pedestrian jaywalked, I think the, the pedestrian should be taken to court. Yeah, I, I'll say my response to that is uh, I've been to Seattle, Washington several times. That's, you know, they don't jaywalk a lot there either. But in New York and D.C., we do. Yeah, Seattle, yeah, Seattle has a lot of dusty beta male coons up there. But um, go ahead, integrate. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, Jack. I think you wanted to say something. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. But um, I think in this article, what matters the most is I think people are not trying. Probably, it's not like to me. Nobody wants to take responsibility as far as the regulation. Um, and to me, I think what that means is again, it's a new concept. They're trying to uh, figure things out. So um, yeah, hold on here. And this uh, is like a political time bomb. I mean, who who wants to really get out in front of this? I, I think that this kind of death, unfortunately, was going to happen anyway. But I think this now gives a boost for uh, insurance companies uh, and uh, the state to start negotiating as to the liabilities. Uh, from what I've heard, you know, I haven't seen any clear articles on it, but there's uh, in the background, they're working on these uh, insurance companies and regulators are, uh, along with legislators, are working on uh, a kind of a framework for these. Uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, these n new laws or uh, I insurance uh, practices for self-driving vehicles. But I don't know if you guys also heard about this. No. I mean, you know, they could. I don't know. I, I was thinking to myself, you know, they could begin with interstate uh, transportation to get at just just to like get away from the whole inner city issue with uh, you know large pedestrian populations. But then, if it's not, you know, I, I, that's probably the better way. But man, the next thing is going to be somebody. Can, man, can you imagine a group of people on a on a I don't want to name a bus company, <laughs> a bus company uh, taking people uh, interstate, and it's a driverless bus. It's like yeah. ah, maybe that that might be the better way to test it though. Although the speed is greater, so the potential for uh, death is greater, but. It's like, do you test it on interstate without the pedestrians, or do you uh, test it in the city? What's what's the safer way? What's the uh, best, uh, most politically expedient way? Mm. Well, I think, well, they've, I think already, that... they've already done a lot of testing. Mm. They've already done a lot of testing in terms of um, Tesla in their um, level five. Well, I shouldn't say level five, but I think it's level four. Um, Basically, their autopilot uh, system, they've put that on hold as of, as of uh, last week or last month. So they're not, they're not finished with testing yet as well. Um, we know GM and, and Waymo and um, Toyota, you know, they're still, they're still ironing out a lot of bugs as well. So it, it's, it's not so much that a, a bus of, 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 you know, that can hold 50 to 100 people would, would be uh, worse because – a bus only, can only go a certain limit, anyways, uh, because of the size. Of, because of the size, um, it's limited to 65 miles an hour in the right in the uh, right hand lane. So that that part is already taken care of. It's just a matter of, um, you know, the uh, type of weather that it might be in. So you have inclement weather. It needs to it needs to break a little bit earlier. It has to be more mindful of that roads are not clear. Things of that nature. You know. The state has to provide uh, other forms of infrastructure development that that is uh, in concert to autonomous vehicles. When you have potholes and misaligned sewer sewer hatches and manhole covers, um, anything that can disrupt it, such as a, a you know a, a, what do you call that? A, you know, snow not being plowed in in uh, in frequent amount of time. All these little things are, are are issues that the state needs to take care of to make sure that you know autonomous vehicle um, autonomous driving actually works efficiently. You know, because yeah, I think the technology they, has been proven to work in the University of Michigan because they have autonomous buses or autonomous shuttles out there that has been proven to work all around the campus. 
Yeah, but in the cities, what's the average speed? What about 35, 40 miles an hour versus 65 on the highway? That's that's a pretty significant, in, you know, increase in speed. Yeah, inner inner cities is very hazardous, though. I think that's the difference. Right, right. More, more. Yeah, that's 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 what I'm saying. What's the what's the right answer? Do you do you do you roll this out initially in the inner city with all of the uh, the obstacles that you talk about, the pedestrian manhole covers, uh, you know, city removal of snow and 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 accident more accidents happen in the city, you know, more traffic issues. I mean, is that the easier path? Or is it easier to, to um, assume the additional risk of the increased speed in interstate? But yeah, it's, this is uh, something to keep uh, pay attention to. Go ahead, Jack. No, I was gonna say, um, as far as like, I know that, I know to you, um, Uber and a lot of companies put a lot of money into this, right? So it's like. You think the uh, state have an invested stake in this? All this? That's why there's a big push for it. State are, the they broke. States? Mm. are they gonna make? Are, are they gonna the tax these? Are they gonna tax them for uh, these vehicles more? Or I'm confused. Why there's such a push for it? A push for what exactly? Uh, for the driverless vehicles. Well, because they they want to speed up the development of the technology, mm-hmm. and in order in order to speed it up, you know everybody has to be on board. Um, but you only have a handful of companies that's actually involved in actually, uh, at least in the United States, that's actually developing this technology. You know, and um, Uber and Lyft have been leading the way, and then you factor in Waymo, and now GM is involved. Um, Ford has their own autonomous uh, vehicles division. I believe Freightliner and Tesla. And Tesla you know they they all i mean they they are major stakeholders in this but um uh, it's not like in china where they have a whole city developed just so just for autonomous vehicles right labor, labor cost labor savings <laughs> you know getting no no employees right oh, more oh, profit less deaths you know that, that's a benefit to the state you know yeah that's what's what's driving it yeah saving labor more profit but but I think uh, the biggest hurdle is actually from uh, the state and federal government, because the roads in America are a disaster. So I, I had hope when uh, Trump was pushing for the trillion dollar infrastructure plan. I thought that was going to be a good time for, like, if a lot of the roads are already going to be, de- uh, you know, uh, redeveloped, um, then for them to, you know, add lanes or. Uh, make infrastructure for autonomous vehicles, but it doesn't look like that's happening now. So, so I think that puts uh, the future of it in, in jeopardy. And another thing is um, if one of these autonomous vehicles go off the road, right, into uh, pedestrian areas, uh, just from whatever kind of software error or anything like that, uh, that could push back self-driving cars, uh, possibly like 10 years just after the political cost of it. Uh, let me ask you a question, Mike. As far as uh, security measures for these vehicles, are these, is this, can this be hacked or anything like that? Like, is that uh, something that should be, they have some place for that? Because, you know, that could, could that can potentially be a, um, a security, security issue, right? Or you think they have that all covered? That's been discussed. Okay. That's been discussed uh, since the conception of uh, autonomous vehicles. So there's something called uh, V2V, vehicle-to-vehicle communications protocol mm-hmm. that has been established that allows cars, autonomous vehicles to, uh, to talk to each other. And mm. they know how fast the next car is going, um, not to run into each other. They use something called LIDAR. So uh, LIDAR sits on the front and the rear of the vehicle. And what that does is it tells uh, the vehicle in front and the vehicle in back um, how much distance it has before it can actually um, apply brakes. That technology has been proven to work. Uh, you also see sometimes on the roof of uh, Waymo vehicles, they have these uh, domes on there. That's also a LIDAR system that uh, tells its surroundings, you know, the other cars and the other lanes um, adjacent to it, um, that if it's going to merge, it needs to merge. So you need to slow down so that I can get into the lane, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole, uh, there's a whole entire infrastructure and framework behind it that's already been taken into place, into consideration. Now, when you talk about cybersecurity, 
um, the only um, part of the cybersecurity is that um, you have to end up with a um, denial of service attack, which is which is called a DOS attack. A denial of service attack means you're basically um, throwing as many uh, uh, um, attempts at the vehicle to communicate, and if you overwhelm it, then what happens is the communication starts to shut down. That's that's what, that's a denial of service attack. So uh, that's been taken into consideration as well. Uh, there's encryption on these vehicles that are autonomous so that they you can't break into it. Uh, and the time it takes for you to break into a car that's moving at, uh, um, you know, 35 or even 65 miles an hour is, is too slim of a window. It won't, it wouldn't work. So the only other way you can actually attack it is by denying its service, you know, a denial of service attack. So if the cars can't communicate with each other, they just end up crashing into each other, you know, uh, basically a pileup. Welcome to Gone. What's going on, Nagon? Hey, what's up, fellas? How you guys doing, man? Great. Do you hear me? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Yes, sir. I'm checking out what you guys were uh, were talking about, so I'm just kind of listening, listening in on you brothers, and uh, you know, uh, you got some of the driverless, uh, driverless, ve- uh, driverless vehicles right now. Um, it seems as though that that technology is definitely advancing up. Pr- Pretty quickly, um, looks like I was thinking it was going to take a little bit longer to kind of come into service, but it looks like over the next couple of years, two years or so, this is going to kind of be here. So, um, and like I said, this is being happening on college campuses and a lot of the places. So um, I was interested because like we told about going out to Ghana, but it's very interesting to see that even Kantanka cars have driverless vehicles and they're making that out in Africa today. So it's kind of interesting. So, so this is, this is where the game is, and I suspect that this is going to uh, ramp up here a, a, a little, a little bit faster. Yeah, yeah. Um, another obstacle seems to be we got to get the the current generation of automobiles off the wall, off the road that don't have that V to V technology you were talking about, Mike. So you know that, that's an obstacle too. Well, I think what would happen is you'll have a cash for plunker type of deal with under Trump. Trump could do something like that, and um. And it's to speed up the process, but what happens? Um, what happens with our, our older cars? Um, there is technology. I know Huawei showed earlier this year that you can take a smartphone and plug it into your OBD2 port via via the USB uh, port on your phone on your smartphone and put it on the dashboard and it would actually drive the car for you. So they demonstrated that that works um, under under their technology um, earlier this year. Uh, out in, um, I want to say it was in China, or it might have been, um, it might have been in Germany or something like that at one of these um, conventions. Yeah, didn't you uh, post the a, a pre- pre- past show? Didn't you post a video? Didn't we have a video about that? Isn't there, isn't there a YouTube video of that? We 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 did a hangout about it, uh, probably like in July or something like that. So, yeah. listeners, you can uh, you uh, know search for it in YouTube. <laughs> You can find it. You should be well, able. To... Well, the, the the phones have um, artificial intelligence cap- capabilities now. Uh, all new phones coming out. All your new Android phones have these uh, artificial intelligence capabilities. So, and they also have the ability to actually, um, you know, plug into the car and actually manage, you know, the uh, the car's uh, computing system to drive it forward and backwards and things like that. It, you know, the it. The opportunities are there, so whether or not you take those vehicles off the road or not, not really all that um, relevant. Um, what would be relevant is is uh, the ability to uh, for adoption, and if you don't have enough people adopting the technology or, or buying the vehicle for that matter, um, it's really not going to be. Um, it's really going to be a while for it. You see it on the road. Uh, you probably won't see full autonomous vehicles until probably like twenty twenty five based on the regulations that we see in this article, you know, some of the pushback. Let me move on to the next article. AMD's misery is Intel's fortune. Intel's pain is AMD's gain. Uh, Article is written by Fortune Teller. So the summary is, over the past few months, Intel and AMD traded as if they are a mirror reflection of each other. One, one's pain is another's gain and vice versa. AMD is overvalued while Intel shows sign of recovery. 
nonetheless, we are holding none as we are currently adopt the skip the chip policy. So a big, just a quick background. Um, you know, Dollar World, I know you're familiar with charts. You can probably make out what's going on here. Uh, 2018 has been a fantastic year for the semiconductor names with one clear winner. Yeah, AMD, AMD. I, yeah. What what with everybody's heard of ETFs and what 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 happens is when when these ETFs uh, buy like a whole a whole sector, a whole industry, like semiconductors, um, that money gets spread around. But then you'll have some individual companies that people will target, and that's what you're seeing with AMD. But uh, with a rise like that, I would expect some of these other ones to uh, catch up to also have a have a pop, uh, with, but AMD would be uh, the leader of the pack, you know. Because uh, the theory is that if it's good for one, if the industry is good, if that, if the economic climate is good for one company in that industry, people just start buying, <laughs> buying other stocks in the uh, in that same industry. But it's clear there who the leader is. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, you know, AMD has been skyrocketing. We've been talking about this on, on these Hangouts uh, probably the last month or so that uh, AMD went from, you know, uh, $18 a share when we talked about it up to, you know, um, $32 a share the last time we talked about it. And now it's down to um, around 28 uh, a, a little bit above 28 right now, $28 a share. Um, estimated that it could reach $60 a share by, you know, Q1 of uh, 2019. So, It'll be interesting to watch and something you should put on your uh your stock ticker. Yeah, especially like I'm just like looking at that scroll back down and see the so we can see the list again, the chart again. Let me blow it up a little bit. Um NVIDIA, is that the uh is that the the, the graphics card company? Correct. Okay, well you know Christmas is coming up. <laughs> so all those PlayStations and 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 and, and Xboxes. So we're going to see some other uh, semiconductors, um, you know, chip, chip, chip manufacturers. They're going to rise as well. Mm -hmm. So that's all I wanted to say. It, it, yeah, Qualcomm actually makes the chips for all your, all your Android smartphones. So they're, they're, they're another player. Um, TSMC, which is Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, actually does the manufacturing of AMD chips. So it's important to um, take that into consideration. And then Micron Technology, which is out in Boise, Idaho, um, makes our, um, you know, the um, memory chips for um, your phones and your, and your PCs and laptops and tablets. Uh, Intel, your obvious 800-pound uh, Gorilla, Texas Instruments does a lot of other um, SOCs, which is a system on chip and analog devices, does the same thing like uh, Texas Instruments, and so does Broadcom. Uh, advanced micro devices has undoubtedly been the fairest of them all, of them all thus far. Nonetheless, much of this lead came on the heels of its arch rival Intel uh, Corporation suffering. The two stocks have become so inversely co correlated that it almost feels like they are a mirror image of each other. Uh, I, I don't want to read this whole article because it um, goes into a lot, a lot more uh, financials than, than it does technology, but. To, to, uh, to help people understand what's going on is that uh, Intel has a chip shortage that they can't fulfill. And what happens when you're a big vendor, when you're a big vendor like uh, Dell, HP, Lenovo, those are your three big vendors. They need chips and they need them now because they need to push out PCs, they need to push out servers, they need to fulfill um, their their orders. And if you if you if you're a manufa if you're a chip chip uh, provider and you can't fulfill these um you know these orders um the vendor has to seek other opportunities somewhere else and AMD is that other opportunity um so what do you do if you if you if you if you make a product and the product normally has an intel chip and you can't get the intel chip or, or one of these others that you can't you can't get what do you do you come out with a new model number uh, for the for the product and explain that this new model number has the AMD chip in it. No, you create a new product line. You say you create a new product line. 
Is that correct? So wow. you you you'll have a uh, you'll have a new new type of product line that is an alternative to the previous generation of of chips that of uh, products that you were offering before. So if you were offering the i i four eighty six or whatever whatever the product name is, well, this next uh, sixty four bit chip uh from AMD would have to take the place of, of of that. You'll probably discontinue that other other product line uh for the foreseeable future because yeah, you don't see, have the supply to actually meet the demand. See that's radical because companies once they change, you know, go to move to another another chip, that's not something that they vacillate on, you know. So they could be they they would make that change and pretty much like move from Intel to AMD and maybe have on what that would be like a multi year kind of contract, right? It's not. It's not um, like they. It's not like they would change for six months and then Intel get their stuff together and they go back. I mean, once you, once you, once, once the, a company goes to another supplier, another uh, chip maker, that business is gone, right? It's if you Intel and you and, and and you lose your business to AMD, it could take years to get that business back, right? No. It's not uncommon that if you're a vendor like Dell or HP, you have multiple uh, segments. So you may have Intel may be your your premier line, and AMD may be your um, let's say Intel is your platinum line, and and uh, and AMD uh, AMD might be your um, your silver line or your bronze bronze line of products. Well, if you're if you're a um, let, let's say you're your Dollar Wheel Technologies, and you need to uh, replace some servers and some computers. It might be better in your budget to to uh you know to buy the AMD product because the Intel product isn't available and it's and it's more costly. Gotcha. And development life the development life cycle might be three is is three years for most companies. It's three so every three years, regardless of, of what technology is available, that product that you bought is going to be out of warranty. You need to take it out of uh, out of asset management, and you need to uh, not have it on your on your um. Um, are a part of your asset portfolio because once it goes out of warranty, it's no good anyways. So most companies just dump it and go get the next new product. Who knows? Three years from now, the next hot and you know the next hot product may be coming from Intel rather than coming from AMD. So you so this this shift that's happening right now, the pre, the pre, the, um, the prediction is that AMD may ride this out until late late next year because wow. Intel can't fulfill that. Um, Intel can't fulfill that uh, uh um, that spot that they had once had before. Got it. Okay, so it's just they it's just they would be selling more of their second tier uh, quality level as opposed to their top tier. It's considered to be second tier because that's what the brand is associated with. But in reality, the the uh, the the process and technology is actually pretty damn stellar. It's one for one almost. Gotcha. We did the math on it. It's almost one for one, but it's cheaper. Gotcha. So, so Intel would have the stronger, I guess, brand, brand, stronger brand. But you're saying in in computation power, uh, AMD is is just as good, if not better, in certain situations. It, it, it yes, in certain situations, and even a company like Apple, who's um, has a strong relationship with Intel. Um, they may see the writing on the wall too, and say, "Hmm, you know, maybe, maybe we, sh maybe we might want to try AMD out." But that's where Intel gets caught up, right? Because Intel is basically married to uh, uh, um, Apple at this point, because Apple is completely designed around Intel products, um, around Intel chips. And if Intel can't provide, you know, the, the supply that it needs, then what's going to happen to Apple? Apple has to delay their product cycle. The next, hmm. the next Apple iMac and the next MacBook can't come out because they can't fulfill the chips. See, and this is uh, stuff that people need to think about when uh, that that are like IT workers. You know, when your company is having a difficult time acquiring a particular product, um, you so that that's information right there that you could use to uh, make some money. <laughs> you can because if that if you know just like what we're saying here, if a company can't meet the demand, that business has to go somewhere else. And so, by you know what type of decisions your company is making. To a, to uh, a, a adjust to the lack of uh, supply for a product that they need is 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 uh, logical to think that other big companies are making that same type type of decision. You can take that 
inside, you know, information, legal inside information <laughs> that you have and you could uh, invest. <laughs> That's good stuff, Mike. Right. Right. Apple Apple has something called a uh, Mac Mini. You know, maybe they might replace that Intel chip that's in the Mac Mini with an AMD one. You know, the user doesn't know any difference. Right. Well, now you're going to bring me pain because I had a Motorola chip, uh, Apple laptop, and then uh, they and then Apple moved to Intel and they just discontinued the whole Motorola line. And it's just this this laptop was working great. It's sitting over in the corner as a brick brick waiting for me to uh, put Ubuntu on it. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> mm-hmm. Got caught up yeah. because uh, the company changed because Apple moved to Intel. So yeah, I feel the pain in what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Let me just go through the uh, chat because I saw somebody. Uh... Diamante, what's up? What's going on, y'all? How y'all doing? Welcome, bro. Welcome. I got a question for Mike. Um, yes, sir. So, with these driverless cars, because um, I guess I'm throwing in between, because, I mean, I like driving, and I like my car, right? Um, is this is these driverless cars, would it be made available to everybody or a select sect in society or, like, because um, they're already saying now that, you know, car people buying cars, that's that number is decreasing. So I mean, are people even gonna buy? Like you said, people even adopt this technology and buy these cars, or or what? I guess I'm particularly talking about United States. Well, it, depending on how strong the dollar is, you know, people may may uh, you, you know, people look at Tesla, right? Tesla as not just a car, but it's a status now. It's yeah. I have the latest technology, right? The, the, it's not even about the car; it's the technology itself. It's an electric vehicle. It has uh, all the all of these software gizmos, you know, um, and, and it charges, right? You don't pull up to a gas station; you you basically pull up to a garage and you just plug your car in. Right. That that sort of uh, um, euphoria uh, for having a Tesla is, is probably going to be carried over into some other uh, brands of vehicles too, like BMW's i3 and the i8. You know, we saw it. We saw what happened with that. Um, I think. What you'll see is the wealthy people in the, in the top 10 percent, top 20 percent that can afford to go out and, and make this purchase will go out there and actually make that purchase. Now, the you know, your top your, your lower half of 80 percent, um, you know, who are at the bottom, who can barely uh, who, who live in places that have food deserts. I don't think they're the, they're the target audience. Yeah, that's so what I, I yeah, think that those people like. will still. Right, those people will still ride the bus. They'll still catch Uber and Lyft. They, you know, the, but the next Uber and Lyft that they may get into may not have a have a driver there. So yeah, so that that's my that's what I'm alluding to. It's like so these these driverless cars. I mean, it's it's only going to be available for people that can really afford it. So I mean, it's really not like something the average man is really going to care about. Because I'm thinking now, like I mean, right now I can change my oil, change my brake pads, and all of that. I mean, what's the point of me buying an electric car if I can't, you know, I can't change a. a Trend, uh, you know, anything in the battery, anything like that. I don't know anything about that. So that that, that was my question. Well, well, see, and then what you're gonna have is manufacturers. You know, your your Fords and your and your uh, Teslas and whatnot. They're gonna lobby to get those old cars off the road and go buy my car. Right. We don't care how you get to it, but you're gonna have to buy my car. Right. We saw that with cash for clunkers. You know, those big SUVs that were. Um, you know, uh, putting out all that smog and wasn't meeting the CO two regulations and things of that nature. Hmm. Well, those cars are no longer there; they got crushed. Right. Hmm. Interesting. Well, yeah, that's what I was wondering. I mean, if you can, if you can put a a battery in a um, in a Crown Vic, what I have, I guess I'm with that. So. Yeah. So let me move on to the next article. If, unless anybody else has anything to add. No, I'm going to say regarding the chips, man. Um, again, like, that's a small business opportunity for somebody, for a team of guys who are in that field, especially black brothers, and, you know, um, can get into the chip industry and could have made, potentially make a million. If you if you're just, if just in position there, you know, you could have made millions right there, you know, because you could have um, walk up to these companies and say, hey, we got this got this for you too so it just makes me think and that's what stood out to me makes me think that uh, that's why it's very important to have a 
ourselves in key positions in certain sectors, right? So, uh, so when something like this happens, you know, um, you know, certain industries can open up for us. You know, certain uh, money can be made for us. Um, people look like us. So, I think that's uh, something people should remember there. Yep, absolutely. All right, let's get to our next article. Um, comes from Singularity Hub. Uh, first ever grad program in space mining takes off by uh, Peter Rejek. Maybe they could call, maybe they can call it the School of Space Rock, a new program being offered at the Colorado School of Mines will educate postgraduate students on the nuts and bolts of extracting and using valuable materials such as rare metals and frozen water from space rocks like asteroids or on the moon. Officially called Space Resources, the graduate level program is reputedly the first of its kind in the, in the world to offer a course in the emerging field of space mining. Heading the, pro heading the program is Angel Abu Madrid, Director of Center of Re Space Resources at Mines, a well-known engineering school located in Golden, Colorado, where Molson Cores taps Rocky Mountain spring water for its earthly brews. The first semester of the new discipline began last month, while Abdul Madrid didn't immediately respond to the interview request. Singularity Hub did talk to Chris uh, Lewicki, President and CEO of Planetary Resources, a space mining company whose Founders include Peter Demandis, Diamandis, Singularity University co-founder, a, a former NASA engineer who worked on multiple Mars missions, Wiki said. The Space Resources Program at CSM, with its multidisciplinary uh, focus on science, economics, and policy, will help students be light years ahead of their peers in the nas uh, nascent field of space mining. So, so I just want to cut it off here because it's basically like an advertisement. But um, we have been talking about this before. Um, our first space and technology hangout we had in July uh, focused on um, the emerging technologies of, of, of space uh, exploration and um, in, uh, uh, space travel, right? Um, we, we've been talking about one in every three startups, next startups uh, in the next year or so will be a space startup of some sort, whether it's uh, launching rockets or um, satellite communications, um, just the varied areas of, of uh, where where uh, there's opportunities out in space rather than on the ground. Do any of you brothers have any uh, thing to add to that? Yeah, it's kind of interesting how uh, two things stuck out to me. Number one is that you guys have been talking about this um, a couple of months ago. So it was like, you know, it also shows that, you know, it gives more credibility to what we're seeing. What we're seeing. And uh, the second thing, too, is one thing I saw on the uh, article it said that one potential asteroid can make somebody a 10,000 quadrillionaire. And I was like, that's it's a, it can uh, throw off the uh, global economic uh, ec uh, economy, right? So I'm like, wow. It is gives thoughts to like, I think we should be going to this in drones as far as a like, young black minds uh, when it comes to um, this field because you know, we can take over that and uh, do great things. Well, okay. you know, th th there's ahead, definitely ahead. a lot. I'm sorry. Who, who's going to go? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go on the go on the hue. Oh, okay. All right. Um, yeah, I was just saying there's there's an awful lot of growth in this. Area. We definitely know that the mining of space is going to be very um, a very big part of the future. I certainly know that China and, and other countries are really looking looking at this heavily to to really get involved in. So for us to really start looking at getting in those t those sorts of businesses and so forth, because I think. Um, it, well, first of all, to get involved in those sorts of businesses are, are definitely a, a tremendous idea in forward thinking. And I believe we want to hang out maybe a month or maybe a couple of months ago, maybe I don't, I'm, I don't know the time, but I was um, 
trying to find out because I think there was some company that was being started in Alaska, and I was wondering how much is it to get a rocket and start, you know, just literally launching stuff out in space. And I think what's the cost of one point five million or something, something like that. Is uh, is it Mike? Are are, are you aware of uh, you know, kind of what uh, what the cost of that would be? It depends on the payload, right? So you can you can actually build a rocket, uh, a hobby based rocket that can get out into space into uh, what they call Leo, which is lower Earth orbit. That can yeah. be done for less than ten, uh, around ten thousand bucks. And, and and that's just a rocket. That's just a regular, um, um, I guess a build your you know a build your home rocket. Is, is that is that we saying? I'm saying as far as payloads put yeah. in, somebody came up with a, with a cost of, of what it would be just to deliver a, a, a minimal payload in, in, into space of. Of one point, I, mean, I don't know. I I just remember a number being mentioned. It was Ulysses. Know. It was Ulysses. It was Ulysses who had that number. Yeah, he's he's in the chat, but he's not he's not able to get on right now. But um, go ahead. Yeah, I no, I was just going to say that uh, it, it is uh probable that um it's supposed to be much cheaper going forward because there's so many um. There's so many new uh, ways to get it up into, into, into space. I think uh, Ghana has spent something like um, $150 lifting a, um, a mini satellite into space with a weather balloon. When you when you really start to think about it, um, there's probably going to be more like um, you're probably going to see more private space companies co- operate like um, like Uber or Lyft. Basically, if if they're going to be uh, launching on let's say uh, um, August, August the third, or the or the, the next Saturday of August, and something like that. You got to plan out your 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 payload to to make sure that it fits within their um, you know, within their uh, time frame to, for delivery. So you may be sharing your satellite with uh, uh, other countries or other companies that need to deploy on that same day. So okay. everybody just basically hitches a hike on one rocket. So this, so it depends on, on when they have their launch window ready to go, and that's kind of when everybody's got to coordinate it around those times. Is that right? Interesting. Um, yeah, and, and share, 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 share the, um, share the, share the fear, basically. Um, right. You know, share the right, 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 right. Make it cheaper, in fact, as well. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, I would All right. like just to just to bring this down to earth a little bit for everybody. If you're going, you're sitting there and listening, going, "Well, look, I'm not getting on no rocket going mining for nothing." Uh, the point of this also is is you you follow these stories. Um, let's say they like okay, Mike. Is there what's in it? What's on the first one? Let's start with even more basic. What's in an asteroid? Do we know? They know that there's water on there, frozen water. Um, there's iron, there's diamonds, there's um, maybe iridium on there. Um, okay. They know that there's gold, there's platinum so these, on, these, on these asteroids. So these are, so, okay, just, just basic, uh, basic science. So the same precious metals are so many, many of the same precious metals that we have here on Earth, on these asteroids. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, in abundance. Oh, in greater abundance. Yeah. Is it easier yes. to uh uh act, act, to get the uh, those minerals or those uh, materials from an asteroid than than digging in the ground here? Probably not, because of the complexity of how fast an asteroid is moving, what it takes to actually get from from point A to point B. How do you get the asteroid? Um, how do you get the minerals and resources back off the asteroid, back to Earth? That sort of deal. I think what you're going to start to see is more, um, more uh, uh, service stops. So basically, you may use the moon to get back from one from one asteroid, uh, and then launch from the moon back back to Earth. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, and, and they're also saying that the quality of maybe some of these minerals on these asteroids might even be even better, like more purified diamond in this type of thing that, that you might see on an asteroid than you might actually see on the ground here. So which it's, I find, this is which I find kind the, of interesting. So this is linked to the space station conversations. I would think so. Uh, I think it's more than that because once you, I guess, kind of perfect this technology, you know, with the next 50 years or so, there's going to be 
uh, you know, colonies on Mars, right? So instead of taking uh, supplies from uh, up, uh, the uh, Earth all the way to Mars, you know, they'll be in between, you know, mines or uh, the mines off the coast of, I guess you could say, Mars, and you and you know, bringing those back onto Mars. Okay. So this gives you, I guess, you know, control over, you know, basically a planet because they'll be re reliant on you uh, bringing um, the supplies uh, onto onto Mars. Okay. Now, as a trader, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I need that kind of information because as I'm reading these stories, you know, I read that I might read that a company uh, has sprung up and this company is uh, uh, publicly traded. <laughs> and, and when you have, when companies uh, come about for new things like this, where it's really not, it's not really known in the beginning how profitable it's going to be, but they have a good idea it's going to be profitable. These stocks are like pennies. They're pennies. And so this, that's, that's when you take a small amount of money and you jump on it, like in the same way that people jump on a crypto, cryptocurrency. You, uh, you jump on it and walk away from it, set it and forget it, you know, jump in it and walk away. So that's how that's how the common person, you know, could 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 uh, benefit from something like this. Even if you're if you're in another industry and you don't think you don't have any I, uh, uh, expectation that you're going to be working in the space technology industry, it's still worth following because there's investment opportunities. <laughs> Well, I think what's going to happen, and this is just me speaking, um, there's a lot of asteroids out there, but who's going to, you know, which country that decides that they're going to deploy a, uh, a mission to uh, any asteroid is going to share those resources with other nation states. So you may see um, an emergence of, of uh, space vehicles armed with, armed with missiles on there that could potentially take out other uh other other mining missions that may have potential uh, rare rare uh, minerals on these uh, asteroids. There's going to be basically what I'm saying. There's going to be a fight over resources in space, and and whoever finds it, you know, is one thing. But whoever can capture that asteroid and land on it is another. And so, what you possibly see is you could you could see Star Wars. So we can see, war, so we can see war in space, right? So 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 we're looking at Absolutely. expanding global conflict in, 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 in into the space game. I, I, you know, people have already been predicting this, and uh, I suspect that that certainly is true, especially if we're looking at the immense amount of dollars and, and resources that, you know, you know, that can be generated from this. Yeah, I could definitely see that happening for sure. Right. They're pirating ships right now, right, in, in, in the, uh, you know, the um, Red Sea and in the uh, Indian Ocean. Well, if they're doing it on, on Earth, what's to say that they wouldn't do it out in space? You may see some private mercenary firms like Blackwater out in space, you know, basically occupying asteroids because, you know, another nation state said, you know, we, we need we need that asteroid. We need somebody to um, take possession of it. You, you know what? Like maybe a couple of months ago, I'd have been like, that's far fetched. But seeing these things that are going on now with, with Japan landing a rover on, on, on an asteroid, successfully it's like man you know it's possible you know it's possible um did, did you guys hear any more um news as far as that rover that they're landing on uh on the asteroid any data on it or anything like that um we'll we'll talk about that next article okay all right let me uh go on to the next article You still there, Mike? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so articles from CNBC. Uh, investing in space. Satellite company partners with uh, AWS to bring internet connectivity to the whole planet. Uh, Iridium is partnering with, partnering with uh, AWS to develop satellite-based network called Cloud Connect for Internet of Things. Uh, IOT um, for short. 
uh, article is by Michael Sheets, who gives us Sheets. Um, Iridium Communications announced at announced a partnership with Amazon Web Services this week to develop satellite-based network called Cloud Connect for Internet of Things applications. We're really covering the whole planet. With terrestrial networks today, it's only 10% or 20% of the Earth. Iridium CEO Matt Desch told CNBC on Thursday, Every, everybody today can connect pretty easily with very little effort. Now that Amazon has put our language in, into the cloud platform, they can extend their applications to the satellite realm. Cloud Connect, which the company expects to launch in 2019, makes Iridium the first and only satellite provider now connected to Amazon Web Services. They said the Cloud Connect network will focus on will focus on where cellular technologies aren't. Uh, they said bringing the rest of the world within reach of AWS. Amazon has been looking to hire people to work on interconnecting space system networks. Earlier this month, the company has never publicly discussed such a, pro such a project. Shares of Iridium rose 7.1% in trading, hitting an all-time high of $21 a share. Iridium stock is up more than 80% this year. The company is nearly finished putting its Iridium Next constellation of sat 75 satellites into orbit. SpaceX is launching the $3 billion satellite network for Iridium with the eighth and final launch happening this, happening later this year. Dish said, Dish has, Dish has called SpaceX critical to Iridium's commercial success, which is now the satellite company's sole launch provider. Once online, Iridium's next will offer services such as higher broadband communication speeds and global airplane tracking. Iridium, Iridium describes the IoT aspect of network as catalyst for stronger subscriber growth. Dish, Dish said the network hosts about half a million active devices growing at a rate of about 20% per of per year for the last three years. With a, AWS on board, Dish said Dish gave a very very bullish estimates for his IoT uh, services. Easily, this could expand to tens of million devices. Uh, what people need to understand is that IoT can be anything at this point. Cars, smartwatches, uh, TVs, um, just about anything that has a wireless uh, connection that can accept an IP will be considered to be IoT. And the whole purpose of rolling out 5G internet is to bring these devices online so that they can all be connected and create these smart cities using these smart vehicles using these smart applications uh, such as uh, cloud-based computing that was mentioned in this article. Um, I won't go into the rest of this article because it's, uh, it's not really important, uh, but the ability to actually um, use satellite technology to uh, uh, deliver uh, you know, broadband technology into places that are rural Places like in Puerto Rico that are very mountainous and don't have a whole lot of cellular um, connectivity. This is this could be a potential game changer as well. Um, something um, that needs to be thought of. Anybody else on the panel have um, anything to add? Um, I'm just thinking as we uh, is is you know it's the world is stuff is changing so fast. We're we're implementing these technologies without a whole lot of manpower. It's like we get a benefit on one end of all this interconnectivity. It's like the the speed of change is moving so fast. It's like okay, it's like when we when we had a, other technologies required uh, a lot of manpower. Like okay, when we went to cellular, we had to put the cell towers up, so there were a lot of jobs associated with that. You know, so it's and when we and something like this. We kind of have to. the The money is going to come in what's created the because of the technology. That's what it sounds like to me. It's as opposed to the the technology itself. I'm not. I'm not explaining this uh, very well. The, te uh, the technology is driving the demand for network connectivity, basically. Right. So, so the 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 ways in which 
networking uh, is going to improve. That's that's the part where um, we're going to we're going to look to capitalize on that part of the equation, as opposed to uh, the technology itself. I'm not. I'm really not explaining this well. It's just the things are moving moving so fast that you know we just have to look also and see. Like when you said, I think it was when you were talking about smart cities. Can you slow slow that down for me and make help me understand what that is? Because maybe that's that's where the opportunities are. What do you mean when you say smart cities? Smart cities means everything is connected on on one one solid network. Um, in order to do something like this, you would have to implement something like blockchain. Um, you, your, your traffic lights, your, your, um, your, your street lights, all your housing, your water resources, your, your energy resources, um, all your institutions, all connected, sharing data um, and gathering data as well, and then process, processing that data through the cloud and then back down to um, marketing firms, advertising firms that want to pitch advertisements to your millennials and your teenagers or whatever whatever else target audience that is in um, place and, and actually allowing the government to utilize these um utilize this data and this infra this, uh this, these digital infrastructures to create a more uh, efficient city. Um, we talked about autonomous vehicles uh, being on the road and all the hazards, but part of the problem with autonomous vehicles isn't the autonomous vehicle itself, but it's the infrastructure that lacks in, that, that is not in place. So if you have a government that can't even fill a pothole, you can't expect the government to put GPS-based satellites in place or 5G-based um, uh, 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 traffic lights in place so that these autonomous vehicles can actually communicate and know whether or not they should go forward or you come to a four-way stop, who should go first. That's what the artificial intelligence has to be put inside the vehicle because the infrastructure doesn't exist on, on the government side. So when you start talking about smart cities, if the city is smart itself, then everything else is gonna is gonna um is gonna function around it. Now so there's a lot of money in play. Thank you. <laughs> Thank right, you. Right. Right. There's a lot of uh, uh there's a lot of opportunities in place for urban urban centers. Um and black people could, uh, and more importantly, black men, um can actually take advantage of these opportunities. The problem is with gentrification, it moves black and brown people out of these cities and, and brings white people back in. So they don't ever actually get a chance to take advantage of these opportunities of these smart cities. And it could be, you could see a new digital divide and new digital gentrification that comes into place with smart cities and, and IOT uh, by placing black and brown people outside of the bubble and, and keeping all the white people inside the bubble. Hmm. Okay. I think that's already starting to happen. I think uh, what after white flight, uh, now uh, younger, um, I guess, uh, white people are moving back into the cities. Mm -hmm. And so in these cities could uh, likely become smart cities with uh, technological advantages that people don't have that live elsewhere. Right, and the first, some of the first cities that are smart are actually um, Hong Kong. Um, you, you see some parts of Japan that are actually uh, starting to become more intelligent. Um, China probably is the sole provider uh, or, or the sole um, controller of, of smart cities because they, the government controls everything from top to bottom and they don't lack on infrastructure at all. In fact, they um, have a whole city that's dedicated to artificial intelligence and drones. Which is how how far advanced they are than the United States. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we're gonna have to be a little bit forward thinking, file this stuff, and you, we start to see this stuff implementing. The new companies start coming on board, and the good thing about when new when new companies come on board and like new areas of technology. It's not a lot of people have experience, <laughs> and sometimes you know you can you can you can get in fall into a good good situation just because you were first you were you know first showing up you know eager and showing that you were you were uh, trustworthy reliable and all of that conscientious worker and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, then this um, is where we tie in with EDX. EDX dot 
org with all that uh, free knowledge that they have on free and low cost knowledge that they have on uh, that site and blockchain and other uh, and automation and uh, other new technologies. Right, and I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because um, w w within this article, they're talking about uh, 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 satellite communications as well as um, AWS. AWS is Amazon Web Services, which is cloud computing, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, things of that nature. That is a huge market. It pays huge in terms of salary if you can actually uh, grasp, the, grasp the technology and the certifications that go with it. Um, Satellite communication is going to be big. Going What's a rough idea of huge? You said huge salary. What's a rough idea of huge? Oh, and, and a uh, AWS architect. AWS architect can make anywhere between one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand a year. Wow. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Like, so, what do you think satellite communications and communications period as in the future is going? Like, do you think it's going to be? Um, it's gonna be it's gonna become like more of a high demand, just such, such as blockchain as well. Or what do you think? Blockchain will be part and partial to uh, cloud computing, which is AWS, Google Cloud Platform, GCP, and as well as uh, Microsoft Azure. I think we talked about this last night. But um, all of these devices, all of these uh, your smart watches and your and your uh, I think the new Apple smart watches are already four G connected. Um, all of these devices need to connect to something, whether it's a cell phone tower or it's a satellite base, uh, uh, satellite base uh, communication, right? We did an article. We read an article about this. I know myself um, on, on one of the uh, space technology hangouts that there's going to be at least a thousand new satellites going up by 2025. I think this article talked about at least a dozen satellites just just for Iridium or something like 75 satellites. So. You're seeing all these satellites go up, but you have very little. You have very few people can actually um, work a satellite if they're not in the military, because the military works on satellites all the time. Um, but if you're not in the military, you won't have that. Um, you know, you won't have that 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 knowledge and that experience of working on uh, satellite communications and knowing why a satellite stopped responding or why why the uh, um, the, the transmission is slow and rebooting satellites and logging into it and doing. There's, there's all types of the satellite communication itself is an industry in itself, and that's something that you know another opportunity I think black men could could should get into. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, time, from, from my from my time, I was in uh, in a broadcast network. They had a, a satellite division, and yeah, it was it's its own. It's definitely it's its own thing. <laughs> and you know, learning like you said, uh, you know, connecting to the transponder and communicating with it and all that yeah it's its own world and like you said it's a lot of military people in it because a lot of people are uh, hired for that came from military but you know some some people uh were able to get in that didn't have a military background and they know that it's the kind of field that you can't really have prior experience in it unless you came from the military but if you have uh a good uh, computer background and that kind of thing they 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 at least the place I you know some of the broadcasting companies they're willing to uh, um, train you and I know a buddy of mine that worked in uh, you know there's various NASA facilities around this one in DC or in Maryland to be exact Greenbelt Maryland so those opportunities are out there yeah yeah I saw a company in um, Texas. Um... I think this might have been Houston, and I think Houston is like a predominantly black area as well. Um, it's not a strong black population. They were looking for um, entry level engineers at eighty thousand dollars each for for a role. Wow! You just now, have were they kind of, kind of flexible? A lot of those, a lot of those um, uh, new jobs like that, and like in satellite, they they're kind of flexible, like. If you have a de undergraduate degree in like uh, computer science or uh, another type of engineering, they can, is that have you found that to be true? That because uh, it seems that I've noticed that that they're they have uh, they're open to a lot a broad area of uh, technical fields. 
from um, people that study the pretty broad. They, they are and they aren't. Um, you have to have, you have to be OSHA certified for one. You know, I, I, I um, my understanding, um, you have to go through the OSHA training. You also have to be OSHA certified, but then you have to have a um, core understanding of, of the fundamentals of uh, of electrical technology. Um, any any community college would, would actually teach you this, or any trade school would actually teach you this. But you still have to have that background um, to understand why a circuit is not responding and whether or not you should replace it, whether whether or not you should solder new capacitors or things of that nature. You, there's there's no way for you to really understand of how to use. Um, uh, um, uh, yeah, that's what that's what I was that's what I was saying. That people, a lot of people that have uh, that have like various uh they may be they may have an undergraduate degree in in you know in say electrical engineering computer science um maybe com you know mechanical engineering whatever they seem to be open uh to that because they they know that you already have the at least the capacity to understand it if you don't i mean have you found that that kind of flexibility exists um, to a certain extent, yes, right? Uh, one of the things that, you know, they, companies can be flexible on is if you, have, if you can pass an aptitude test. That's, that's the first thing. It, your, background doesn't, your background in computer science wouldn't really transfer much into it because computer science doesn't really talk too much about um, the electrical engineering aspect and communications aspect. It really goes over the uh, um, linguistics of programming. So it's, it doesn't really transfer over, but... I get what you're saying that, that you have some kind of technical background, but the technical background doesn't always translate into uh, core knowledge. Of, of, right, of, right, uh, yeah. I'm just saying, in terms of that background, demonstrating a certain aptitude to understand, you know, something complex. <laughs> complex by design. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anybody else got anything you want to add to this? All right, I'll move on to the next article. <laughs> Hey, Mike, I'm going to have to drop for a quick second. I just got, I'm taking care of a couple of things. I'll be back in a little bit. You guys are going to be on how long or how long do you think? Uh, 12, 12 o'clock. All right, I should, be, I should be back by then. All right, see you then. All right. Have a good one. Later. All right, next article comes from popularmechanics.com. Um, Voyager 2 is getting closer to interstellar, interstellar space. It's picking up readings similar to Voyager 1 when it made its when it made the, the leap. Uh, article is by David Grossman, October 5th. It appears that Voyager 2 will be following its sibling through one of the ultimate barriers in spaceflight, the border of interstellar space. NASA is reporting that the Voyager 2 probe launched on August 20th, 1977, has detected an increase in cosmic rays that originate around, that originate outside the solar system. With, with that data and the fact that Voyager 2 is almost 11 billion miles away from home, scientists assume that it is close to leaving the confines of the solar system. For the last 11 years, since 2007, Voyager 2 has been traveling towards the outmost layer of what is known as heliosphere. The heliosphere is the heliosphere is a bubble-like region of space that encompasses not only all eight planets, not only all eight planets in Pluto, but far beyond as well. It's a poorly written article. The sun's solar wind plasma maintains this bubble against the pressures of helium and hydrogen gases from the Milky Way. Sorry about this. This is uh, jumping around all these advertisements. The outer, the outermost layer of the heliosphere is known uh, Helios Pars. Beginning last August, Voyager 2's cosmic ray subsystem built to detect cosmic ray notice 
a 5% increase in these rays hitting the probe. Speedy particles that originate outside the solar system, they are partially blocked by the heliosphere. The, pro the probe is currently traveling through a middle section of the bubble known as the helios sheath. But as Voyager 2 moves towards the heliopause, the cosmic ray is it encounters will rise. For the first time, scientists are able to compare one object, one object's journey through the heliosphere with another. Voyager one crossed through the territory years ago in 2012, and its own CRS detected a similar rise in cosmic rays. But scientists are quick to note that every interstellar journey is unique, and that Voyager two is traveling towards a different part of the heliopause than Voyager one. We're seeing a change in the environment around Voyager 2. There's no doubt that there's no doubt about that, says Voyager Project scientist Ed Stone, based at Caltech in Pasadena, in a press statement. We're going to learn a lot. We're going to learn a lot in the coming months, but we'll still know. We still don't know when we'll reach the heliopause. We're not there yet. That's one thing I can say with confidence. When Voyager 2 does hit helio. When Voyager 2 does hit the heliopause, it will likely experience what Voyager 1 did, a termination shock that comes from that comes when solar winds collide with interstellar medium. And one of the greatest space programs in human history will will add one more accomplishment to a very long list of firsts. This is interesting. Um I didn't even know that they could still communicate with a uh, you know, with a satellite that far away. Um I mean, that's pretty far, 11 billion miles. A lot of this technology that they're using is extremely old. Um, it launched in 1977. This is before dial-up um, computers. Uh, computers had dial-up modems. So you have to keep in mind that um, you, can't even find, you can't even find a dial-up modem now. So you imagine the technology that they're using inside this, um, you know, the Voyager um isn't even available you know it's, it probably takes months for it you know i would say it probably takes a month and a half before they can get a, um, a signal from it what are you guys thoughts on this <laughs> about about a billion miles away <laughs> this <Yeah>. is <laughs> so wait a minute explain you got to slow this down now all right so voyager uh, i was trying to Skip, skip ahead, and we're talking about um, Voyager One was uh, launch when? Nineteen seventy-seven. Okay, wow. I'm trying to think, what was the technology in seventy-seven? So we didn't even we didn't even have personal computers then. I think Voyager was launched in seventy-five or seventy-six. Voyager Two was launched. Voyager One. Right, Voyager One was launched in uh, seventy-five, I think. Okay, and Voyager Two was launched when? Seventy-seven. Okay, yeah, we didn't even have personal computers for either one. You didn't even have cell phones back then. You, you imagine like the, a lot of the technology that NASA uses is so old and decrepit, but it still works. Right, it, it, at least it works out in space. But you got yeah. computers that you buy from Best Buy, like an e machine or something like that, and it doesn't even work, you know, right now at this point. You only bought it a couple of years ago, right? Wow. Yeah, I I think the uh, really the the biggest benefit to um, space technology and uh, space exploration is that a lot of the technology that we use today um, was really what was cutting edge. Um, uh, space flight technology, right? So getting people out into outer space or even getting a satellite into outer space takes a lot of uh, engineering, you know, ingenuity. So a lot of that was later on used in the civilian sector by businesses, uh, you know. And a lot of uh, cutting edge space technology has, I don't think it's been changed much, uh, much since the 70s or 80s. Is that correct, Mike? No, it's not correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay well that's what i was thinking because there hasn't been um at least when it comes to sending humans out um uh how, how should i how do i explain this 
like a lot of the core uh, elements of it are, are are still what was cutting edge back in the sixties and seventies. Um, you have to factor in that uh, energy energy uh, resources, right? So battery technology. Um, I think what they were using back then on on satellites was like nickel cadmium, right? Nickel cadmium batteries, NICADs. Today they're using lithium polymer batteries. <clears throat> lithium, po excuse me, lithium polymer and uh, lithium ion batteries on on these um on these new uh, satellites. Because even like your new Boeing, um, you know, jumbo jets are using these uh, LiPo batteries and whatnot inside their planes. So um, the battery technology has changed drastically, where they can actually last. Um, you know, uh, what's supposed to last, you know, maybe five or six years is actually going for twenty years now. So um, what are what are we looking for? <laughs> I mean, uh, or or this was just as it says, space exploration, just to see what we can see. Well, they know based on um, the recent pictures. I don't know if um, if we covered it or not, but they found a Earth-like planet outside uh, outside where Voyager is going. It's same size as the Earth, same same um, resources as the Earth, but just you know uh, uh, x amount of miles away. So a, you could get there, but um, not with current technology. Wait, 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 wait. Maybe, maybe you said the, when you slow down for me, you said the same resources as Earth, so it could sustain life. Similar resources, yes. There's, there's a there's a high there's a high probability that they're saying that if they're if if it has similar resources at Earth, there's a probability that there's something you know they could have life on there. Now, what they found on Mars is that they have you know obviously that we I think we discussed this before that there have been lakes and rivers and things like that on Mars at some point before. You know, and this may have gone back you know uh, what maybe 65 million years ago, if not longer. Yeah, I know what's on that planet. Oh, really? Yeah, what's on that planet? Car keys, that that sock that didn't come out the dryer. <laughs> All the stuff that disappeared on Earth, huh? That's right. That's where it is. Yeah. Jet, Jedi, Jedi Focus is saying it's 8 million light years away. Man. Wait, what is it? Yeah. That, that's, that, that other planet that I, I was referring to that the, uh, the, the telescope, the, re, the new telescope has found. So when does it run out of uh, fuel, power, you know, uh, some, I guess both, with Voyager 1 and 2, when do they run out? It doesn't say. Um, I think they're just floating for the, I think the gravitational pull is is what they use for acceleration. So it's not like, oh, it has like these turbo boosters on it that's, um, that it really needs, like a jetpack or something like that. It's just, it's just floating. In the direction so it doesn't. It, it doesn't have to. It's transmitting information back to us. It doesn't have to. It's just going to become space junk, or do do we need it back? I, That's I, what I'm trying. In terms of the data that no, we you don't no, no, you yeah. don't need those back. You, you usually let them let them die off where they're going. So gotcha, gotcha. That's So they have, so they know how far this other planet that's uh, similar to Earth is. So uh, because of the information from these voyagers, so that helps them what refine uh, additional uh, voyages to at least have uh, something to target. <laughs> yeah, basically creating a Google Maps of, of, of space. Okay, okay. Yeah. But again, you know, because of uh, it's a political thing, if we don't have the money or to pr uh, prioritize uh, space exploration, um, then we can't benefit. You know, we can't benefit from what we don't explore from what we don't learn 
that's just contingent on if any of the other world powers start making really big moves uh, in space, like uh, the Soviet Union did. Then magically yeah. we'll find the money. <laughs> right. Well, you know, they create money out of thin air, you know, with computers. I think we talked about this uh, uh, Economics Friday. Um, that's true. Create some zeros inside a computer and print, and print out the money. Right. Uh, that That's that's what the Federal Reserve said. Uh, uh, <laughs> what's his name? Um, the one in Minneapolis. Uh, I forget what his name is. The, the new guy. He, uh, we, I got to do a tour of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve. And uh, during the tour, we just we asked him. Okay, so how exactly is the money made? Is it printed? He says he said no. We don't do any of the printing. That's the that's the Treasury Department. We just put zeros in a computer. And that's <laughs> that's how the money is made. Mm -hmm. I wish I could do that. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, the next article is from Engadget. Um, Lockheed's concept moon lander can carry four astronauts. The huge spacecraft can chill for up to 14 days on lunar surface. That's an interesting image, too, just looking at that. Very interesting. Lockheed Martin has unveiled the designs for reusable lander built to ferry four astronauts and 1.1 tons of cargo between lunar orbit and the surface of the moon. Leveraging tech from the aerospace giant Orion space Orion spacecraft for deep space missions, the 14 meter single stage vessel can camp up to 14 days on the moon. Upon touchdown, the crew will use the crafts this elevator platform to get from the cabin to the surface before blasting back and back to their home base aboard Luna's orbital platform gateway. A small space station that has a small space station that NASA plans to start constructing in 2022, uh, with enough juice to last for, last the full two weeks. Refueling would take take place between missions. Though lander can also be powered up on the surface, the preliminary concept relies on four modified Arlo 10 engines, but other other engines could be also utilized. Lockheed's vehicle will be twice as tall as the lunar module used during the Apollo mission to the to the moon nearly half a century ago, reports Ars Technica, which carried two astronauts for brief stints of just a few few days. The company's the company says it will also serve as a precursor for Mars its Mars lander, also built to carry four people, which is integral to its Mars base camp orbiting mission. Last December, Donald Trump signed off on a space policy directive directive that calls for NASA, along with private partners, to send astronauts to the moon and eventually Mars. And Lockheed is one of the private sector companies vying for vying to be part of the exploration program. The company claims its lunar lander will be ready by the late 2020s, according to Space.com. The gateway is key. The gateway is key to full, frequent, and fast reusability of this lander, said Tim uh, Sitchin, space, space, uh, space exploration architect at Lockheed Martin Space, who presented the lander concept as international astronomical. <sighs> I'm having a hard time trying. My eyes are killing me. Uh, who presented the, the lander concept at international astronautical, astronautical Congress in, in Bremen, Germany, because this lander doesn't have to endure the punishment of re-entering Earth's atmosphere. It can be reflown many times over without needing significant and costly refurbishment. That's major. That's the major advantage of having a, ga a gateway in a module, flexible, reusable, and approach to deep space exploration. I think this is um. I think this is, uh, you know, groundbreaking in terms of um, sp space exploration. Uh, I'd be interested in seeing what they can do beyond the moon. Um, Mars is Mars would be a key mission, but I think that uh, getting onto Titan um, would would, uh, would be uh, an amazing endeavor for um, 
for anybody, regardless of what the company is and what the what the uh, what the country is. I think that would be uh, really key. Anybody else have anything to add? Or no. if I uh, jump it up this article. Got nothing. I have a question. So uh, this is is this just um, I guess a not a sketch design, but uh, a model that they say they're going to make, or have they already built it? I think it's already in the. Um, I think it's already in the uh, early phases. Okay. It says it's supposed to be done. Right. Yeah, it says it's a concept for right now, but it's not like it's in its early phases. This would be interesting if uh, they get up to the moon first, and then you know use that as a launching, um, I guess, launching pad to go to Mars. <clears throat> yeah, it doesn't seem to have a whole lot of fuel for um, going anywhere beyond where it, where where it's uh, where it's intended to, but. Like I was saying before, if they, can, if they can get something like this off the Titan, that would be huge. But um, you know, that's probably twenty years twenty years from now. But I always find it interesting to know that these articles talk about um, you know putting people on the moon as, as some um, you know some kind of like real uh, challenging endeavor when when supposedly they did it you know forty forty five plus years ago or fifty years ago you know um, whatever. Right. Right. But but do you think that we should just go straight to Mars and uh, uh, you know Titan and all those other plans without first having a I guess kind of a international base in uh, on the moon? Because I they, don't know if there's going to be an international. Oh, good. No, I was going to say I don't think there's going to be an international base based on some of the commentary that you hear from uh, the presidents of Russia, India, and China. In, in uh, Japan, the Prime Minister of Japan, that uh, they all plan to put in their own independent bases on the moon. So, if it's going to be international, it's going to it's not going to be like um, the ISS. Huh? It's not going to be like the uh, space station, right? It's not going to be like that. It sounds like it's going to be like uh, Djibouti, out in Africa, where you have all these military bases <laughs> all, all on the same highway. Uh, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> uh, Man, okay, that's that's more dangerous, I think, if uh, people start putting up, uh, you know, their own stations there, um, because then that that provides uh, them a security threat for the other countries, uh, you know, in case they put up, you know, military installations up there to to fire back at uh, at at the Earth. Well, I I think. I read that uh, China and Russia want to work together on putting a, a base on the moon. Um, I know there's a mission for 2030 that that's supposed to be on track, you know, uh, putting something on the moon. Um, I know South Africa was talking about um, putting um, putting their module on the moon or putting a um, a uh, maybe a transponder or a rover on the moon by 2035. Um, that that's but you know this is South Africa you know they're still looking for land reclamation. I don't think they should be uh, trying to claim any land outside the solar system, but that's a whole different topic. But um, <laughs> all right, I move on to the next article. I, I do think I I like that image though. It looks really cool. All right, this article is from space.com. Rest in peace, mascot. Hopping lander meets its end on asteroid uh, Reagle. Article is by uh, Mike Wall. Um, this is just the uh, 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 artist rendition of um, what the uh, lander looks like. All 
I'm not going to read this whole article because it's uh, not really relevant other than the fact that uh, it landed. Um, mascot asteroid landed. The, the, mascot, the mascot asteroid lander lived fast and died young as, as planned. The shoebox size hopping robot, which touched down on the 3,000 foot wide asteroid Rigu Tuesday night, uh, has given up the ghost. Mission team members announced this announced this morning on October 4th. This seems pretty quick, but Mascot's non-rechargeable lithium-ion battery actually lasted a bit longer than expected, 16 hours. Oh, you got to be kidding me with these ads. All done with work. Oh, my. Can that be right? I explored Riegu for more than 17 hours. That is more than my team expected. Do I get paid overtime for this? Uh, hashtag Asteroid Landing mascot said. Must have some kind of AI in it. And during this extra time, I also made another hop and explored part of the third asteroid bay. Or the third asteroid day. But the best thing is I sent all the data co I collected to Hayotukin. I think that's how you pronounce it. Now the team, it's up to you to understand right Riegu. Mascot added this in another tweet. It's interesting. I don't know much about this um you know, this uh this landing module that they uh deployed out there. I guess um I guess that's a lot of artificial intelligence in, that they built into this. Yeah, I haven't even heard about this. Uh, the last one I heard about was landing a, a probe on a, uh, an asteroid, I believe was the European S Space Agency, uh, the one they did, uh, which failed, but I haven't heard about this one. I heard about, I heard about it, but I haven't looked into the uh, module itself, the uh, landing module itself. I, I I didn't know they put all this technology into it, where it talks and stuff like that. Kind of like a uh, Tamagotchi or something like that. Hayabusa 2 deployed two tiny solar-powered solar powered hoppers called Minivera 1, Minivera 2 1A and Minivera 2 1B onto Riegu's sur uh, rugged surface on September 21st. This duo remains active on the asteroid today. Then came Mascot, which was built by German space, German Aerospace Center, known by the German acronym DLR, in collaboration with French Space Agency, CNES. The 22-pound Mascot carried four instruments, a camera, a, spectrum, a spectrometer, a magnetometer, and a radi radiometer. So the lander probably being a lot of the lander probably being a lot of data up to Hayabusa, and this will if this info will pro presumably make it back to Earth soon. Uh, some of the data has already returned. In fact, the mascot team made public a photo that the lander snapped in Regal while descending towards the asteroid. Uh, That's pretty interesting. Seems kind of useless to have a um, a device that's going to die within less than a day just to take a picture. I mean, you have telescopes that you can buy at like Best Buy or Amazon that can take pictures too. I, I just don't see the, the logic behind it. Maybe they're trying to do, uh, I guess, um some sample testing while they're there. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't think it said that. Wheels are useless. Wheels are useless on extremely low ga gravity bodies such as Riegel. A robot would float on the surface as soon as the tires start turning. Japan, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency uh, officials have said, so the Riegel robots were all designed to hop. Mascot did this by manipulating a metal swing arm inside its uh, boxy body. It's interesting. We could see more than one hop hopper deployed from the Hayabusa too. The orbiter also carries an 
optional explorer called uh, Minivera uh, 2.2, I guess that's how it's pronounced, which is about the same as uh, 2.4 pound Minivera 2.1 Duo. Minivera 2.2 uh, was built by a consortium of Japanese universities. The Minivera 2.1 pair was provided by JAXA and University of Izu. This is just a, uh, I guess, a um, artist animation rendering. I imagine all of this is, uh, you know, just practice, uh, right? Um, they want to start testing it out, see, you, you know, what what any of the kinks could be later on when they launch something more substantial onto it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the only thing that makes sense, given that it didn't have a lot, a lot of battery power, so maybe it was just testing the, the uh, the journey itself, you know, not really so much about collecting information. Because how much you gonna collect with a battery power that's sh that's short, you know? It's yeah, probably it's probably. I'm sorry, it's what? Did you say 150? No, I was gonna. It's, it, the caption under it says it's 150 million dollars. In space technology money, is that a lot? <laughs> it's actually pretty cheap. Okay, that's it's it. Actually pretty cheap. I think, I think the United States spent something like uh, six hundred million just going to Mars. So, that's the last article. Um, if anybody has any comments, this is open mic for right now. Nope. It's the size of a shoebox. Um, I find that to be very relatively interesting because uh, you can do a lot uh, with, with something that um, of, of that capacity. Uh, I'm surprised that it doesn't have any, it doesn't have enough gravity on the uh, asteroid itself. So that means putting humans on 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 an asteroid is, is out of the question. You're not getting on it, according according to the article. Um, if if you came and put in, um, you know, a moon lander, or not a moon lander, a um, a uh, lander box on 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 the um, on the asteroid because it, uh, you know, as soon as the wheels turn, it, it just loses gravity. You're not putting a human being on it. It's just not going to happen. As soon as you start walking, you're, you're basically uh, lifted off. <laughs> wow. So maybe that maybe that was the test. Yeah. Yeah. That that could be. I mean. What I saw before from the uh, European Space Agency, uh, and I think um, anti-gravity had touched on this earlier, um, they had harpoons that shot into the one of the other asteroids in order to uh, uh, um, anchor it down, anchor itself down with um, with pulleys. So basically, the, once the uh, harpoons go into the surface of the asteroid, the pulleys actually reel it, reel it in like a um, like a fishing pole would. Um, it reel it in slowly as, as, it, as it gets down to the ground. That did not happen. Um, it actually the harpoons actually missed in the um in the uh the, the uh the lander actually tipped over so it, it couldn't recharge its batteries it was on its um solar panel side and it couldn't recharge the batteries because it didn't have any sunlight and the batteries just basically ran out man it sounds like this this is a great business if you have a <laughs> if you're getting some money from NASA to participate in these experiments, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, something that's costing $150 million. And you, right. just, and you just sending a, a shoebox to an asteroid. <laughs> that's some good money. <laughs> I would say so. Right. Looking at this little image right here. Looking at the little image on the side, on the right-hand side, and it shows how it deploys out of the satellite and just drops off like a little magic box. I think that's pretty cool. Well, right. A lot of the space travel stuff, originally I thought it was going to be first uh, a lot more government investment than it was uh, than it is currently, but I guess um, 
it, it's gotten cheap enough that uh, private businesses can, you know, start making a lot um, bigger impact than it originally I thought. But go, go ahead, uh, Dalva. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Oh no, that's it. That's what I was gonna say. Now I was gonna change the subject. <laughs> And you said earlier you uh you know express some reservation if we had never been to the moon. I want I want to know. <laughs> have, have, do you think we've ever really been to the moon? Are you, are you asking me or anti gravity? I'm asking uh, you, Mike, or both. Oh, oh, um, and the pan and the chat also. <laughs> You're a troll maker. Here, here, here's my here's my perspective, right? You didn't have all of this. Um, you 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 didn't have all this modern technology that you had back then, right? So you only had one tenth of the technology that you have today. But you were able to send a whole entire, you know, uh, uh, two men to the moon with with these uh, vehicles, and you planted a flag there, and then you left. And for the next forty, fifty years, you you had not returned. Even though you have ten times the amount of technology today that would allow for something like this to happen, again to for, you know to replicate the same mission, but you didn't do it. I just I, I question the validity of this uh, claim that they're you know that they did this. I'm not saying that they did not. I'm just saying I don't see the legitimacy behind it. I don't see I don't see any um, evidence to prove that. I mean, they show these pictures, but these pictures don't really mean much to me. I don't see. The actual evidence. I mean, we know that this, uh, uh, um, you know, this uh, landing box is up there because it actually um, took the pictures, right? We, we see we see the pictures and stuff like that. Right. Uh, I don't question the validity of these pictures, but I don't see any evidence that, um, you know, that back then they didn't even have uh, uh, color TVs back then, and yet they have these color photos of of, <laughs> of people walking around. I, I just Sorry, I, I just not buying that. Okay, <laughs> I didn't think of that. I mean, you know, you gave me a good answer because I'm still stuck on your first point that uh, why would it's counterintuitive that we wouldn't have gone back uh, as a as a government mission and or or as a a private mission? You know, why why would we not go back in forty fifty years? Um, and like you said, with all the additional, uh, with the technological advancements, going back would be cheaper. <laughs> so, yeah, it's counterintuitive to think that we would not have gone back. I, I think the reason that we haven't gone back is because it, it's far, far too expensive, right? Um, at the but, time, but it's less expensive than the than when we quote unquote did it the first time, right? Right, right, but I. I I think originally, you know, during the '60s, because of the Cold War, there, there was the political will to uh, go to go do as much as in space as possible, um, you know, to beat to beat the the Soviets. But I think after the Soviet Union fell, it's it was far too expensive, you know, considering the cost back there. I don't know what was the price tag for, you know, the space uh, the moon landing, but it must have been quite extraordinary. But I don't know, that, that's just my opinion on probably why they haven't gone, gone back. Well, you haven't proven that they actually done it. <laughs> uh, I don't know, the, the, the Soviets are smart. I don't know if they would really buy any propaganda move of, uh, you know, the, the U.S. saying that they went up there, but then not actually doing it or, you know, producing it in a, you know, Hollywood studio. You know what I mean? Because they, well, they have... That a space. I'll just say this real quickly. Basically, they had quite almost similar capabilities, so they could check, right, that there was a, a launch and that it, you know, it went up to the moon. And the, so, uh, and the Russians haven't said anything. So either they cut a backroom deal uh, for the Russians to keep quiet, or they most likely did go up there. Well, the Russians were able to get up to um, the Venus, right? 
Right. I, I think you 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 sent that. Um, I think the article on that, if I think if I remember correctly. Right. They failed. You know, thirteen. Well, no, I shouldn't say they failed thirteen times, but they've had thirteen attempts at um, getting up there. Um, that's been proven. If you're telling me that the Americans did it and they couldn't replicate it more than once, that I, I, I question the validity of it. I, I just don't. You, you, your cell phone today, your average iPhone, has 10 times the technology in it, in the palm of your hand, than what they had in the 1960s. Your, your cell phone, your, your, your iPhone can actually power, you know, the, uh, 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 the space mission from back then. How come they haven't done it? Yeah, that's a fair question. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew you'd have a good answer. That's why I said I'm not going to let them get away with this one. <laughs> I'm going to have to ask. And you, got, you, you provided a good answer. That's something to think about. Uh, uh, one person in the chat, Faber, he said, uh, also, weren't those images transmitted from the moon? Uh, was our technology, or was our communication technology advanced enough back then? I think there's a, that's a yes for that one, uh, because they did launch satellites and um, they were able to communicate with the satellites. I don't know if you're able to speak on that more, Mike. Um, well, when did we get color TV? Was it? When did we get color TV? Um, I, I want to say like the eighties or nineties. I don't know. You probably know more about this than I do, but I don't even remember it. I don't even remember when we got color TV. I was born in nineteen sixty four. I do not remember when we got color TV. Now I do know that it happened in my lifetime. I remember throw I remember throwing black and white TVs in the trash. <laughs> but I don't remember when we got the color TV. But but in terms of the color um in, in in broadcasting, I think the technology existed far before it became commercially viable. It was just too expensive uh for the average home to start getting it. Uh same thing with color pictures. They had color pictures back in the 19, I want to say 30s, uh, but uh, it, it was just uh, too expensive. The, the Nazis actually produced some um, colored pictures. So, so did the U.S. I, I'm sorry, I stepped. I'm sorry, I stepped away. Um, I, I heard anti anti gravity had a question, but I didn't catch what it was. Um. Basically, um, a favor in the chat, he said that uh, during that time, w was there the technology, uh, communication technology to send, to send, um, you know, uh, information back from the moon or from space. And there were satellites at the time. So I don't know if you want to speak to that. I, I think that they, they were able to communicate with uh, satellites. Yeah, but they didn't have color color processing back then. Is what I'm saying. They didn't have you know uh, um, CCD uh, processing on these cameras. So how is it that you the, the images that they present right? And, and I don't I don't want to bash anybody who does believe in this stuff. I'm just putting putting the argument out there. They show these um, these astronauts that supposedly two, according to the article, um, the, the previous article that we read, two astronauts that made it to the moon. One's driving around on a, on a dune buggy, and the other one is where? Where did they get that image from? Was there a tripod camera with a DSLR, you know, uh, attached to it? I mean, who who took that picture? <laughs> Was somebody doing a selfie? <laughs> so you, wait a minute, wait a minute. You said two people up there and both of them in the frame. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think that technology for color pictures that, or, or color video, was it a video or a picture? Um, it, was a, it was a picture, but the, there was also a video that's attached to it. You didn't have. I think uh, they had uh, the portable cameras for color pictures back then, uh, color video back then. So who took the picture? 
Uh, I don't know, man. <laughs> His only explanation would be a tripod, <laughs> but I don't know how. With a delay on it to, to snap the frame later. Right. <laughs> I don't know. I can't speak on that. What? Wow. I, are you? I mean, did Neil Armstrong have like a selfie stick, like over his shoulder, and <laughs> like I, I don't. I, don't don't get me started on this shit. <laughs> but I, I believe it was like uh, six or seven years ago. Uh, uh, one uh, Neil Armstrong was walking into some area. I don't know where uh, was some kind of building, and a person <laughs> he kind of yelled at him, "Hey, you never been to the moon?" Uh, and he punched him. So I don't know if that <laughs> gives credibility to whether or not he's been on the moon or not. But I guess that's a thing. Something we should mention as well. Well, I mean, that could be like Alzheimer's or something kicking in and you just like reacted to it. I mean, <laughs> I want to give these guys the benefit of the doubt, right? I want to say that, yeah, they've been up there. But when I put all of these attributes together and I say, well, who took the, who took the picture? Who, how did you get a steady picture if you're bouncing around on the moon and there's no gravity up there? <laughs> right. And they got like modern cameras with stabilization and everything. <laughs> yeah, like with a with a, with a Carl Zeiss lens on it. Like, come on. <laughs> well, I, I guess what would be the flip side? Um, if they did produce it in Hollywood, did Hollywood have the technology to to do? Um, I guess manipulate this kind of uh, video at the time. I think I think Hollywood played a strong role in a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, uh, backdrops and things like that. Because Saudi Arabia uh, a year or so ago created a because um, Saudi Arabia has ambitions of going into space as well. They did a um, a promo for their space mission like to Mars or something like that, and they used their desert, I think like outside of Mecca, Medina, or something like that, to um, Present this, uh, you know, this, uh, this imagery of, you know, um, a a Saudi astronaut driving up and down the desert or something like, uh, not driving up and down the um, the the dunes of of Mars or something like that, and they're using the Saudi desert for this. It, it looked real when I saw it. I thought it was real, but you know, yeah, that's actually that's a good point. That's a good point. Wow. Well, ask and answer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know what else to say. I, I hate to crush people's, you know, uh, uh, hopes and dreams about going to the moon and things like that. Because I, I really don't care. Right? I don't, I really, I really don't care about uh, whether or not they did it. I just want somebody to who says that they did that they did do it to actually prove it. All right. Because all the technology that you have today. You have um, drone technology. You have uh, satellite, new satellite capabilities. Um, you have uh, all these uh, new moon landers and stuff that are coming out. Why is it taking so long for you to complete a mission or complete a task that was done simply in the 1960s? And they didn't have any technology back then. They were busy beating the hell out of Martin Luther King over his head with billy clubs and sticking dogs on them. It, I don't. I don't get it. Like. If it's so easy to, if it was so easy back then, why can't they do it today? Fair the question. Chinese and the Russians are having a hard time. The Chinese and the Russians are having a hard time doing it. Israel is just aren't even thinking about putting a man on the moon. They're they're, they're saying we're going to put this trash can on the moon and we're going to put you know, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, what do you call that? Um, a yarmulke on 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 a, on, a, on a satellite and, and call it you know. <laughs> I mean, to think that we would have that kind of a head start and just do nothing. Yeah, that's 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 really uh, hard I, I, to accept. I, I yeah, I, I question the validity of it. I, I just don't trust the people who you know the same people who say they put a man on the moon, or the same people who uh, want to deny that there were black people in in, in Africa that that. Um, you know, built Egypt, you know, built the pyramids in Egypt. So, wait, wait, could you repeat the last part? You said who's denying it? 
the same people who are saying they put a man on the moon are the same people who are denying that black people actually created the pyramids in Egypt and in the space. Right. Uh, yeah, there's a on a history channel. I think it's called uh, Alien. <laughs> um, <laughs> and basically, they're saying that, that, that it was aliens built the pyramid. <laughs> aliens built the pyramid. Yeah. <laughs> they can't give them anything. Right, right. It's like, well, do I, yeah. Did you capture one of these aliens or? Yeah. It's, no way a black person could have well, built those pyramids, you know, 2,000, 5,000 years ago. No, it had to yeah, be. and you got people who are willing to accept. Yeah, yeah, aliens. That's, that, that sounds more like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, despite the fact... Right, despite the fact that the size of the nose is no different than, uh, you know, um, some of the black people you see in the United States. You're going to tell me that right. there's no semblance between the two? Maybe they're trying to say that we're aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, we we so are known for some pretty far out stuff now. <laughs> I mean, so many statues that so many statues that you see in Africa, you know, uh, in terms of um. Now I'm just using uh, Egypt for example, you know, with the space and whatnot. I mean, they have the same width nose and same structured uh, pheno phenotypical features as like George Foreman or or, or even Evander Holyfield or something like that after a match and something like that. I, I just find it interesting that you don't see any European features in some of these um some of these statues. I, I you know, right. Well, well, they they blew off the nose purposes, uh, purposefully um, back in the nineteen and no eighteen eighties and up to like the 1920s when they were first, um, I guess, colonizing or beginning to colonize uh, Africa. Uh, right. That was a calculated, you know, plot. <laughs> I think it's pretty settled now that that was the case, but a lot of people still don't believe that. Don't believe what? That uh, those pyramids were built by the, you know, inhabitants of those lands, you know, the gotcha, ancient. Gotcha, gotcha. Right. Uh, a lot of the anthropology books, uh, you know, taught today, um, were written by those guys back back then. So, <laughs> suffice to say, very very racist. Uh, aliens, okay. No, I would look at the stocks of all these companies, though. Uh, for people who are watching, um, I think the stocks of these companies uh, would be very relevant. Um, very relevant. Um, in regards to investments, um, obviously, if they're working on space missions, that they um, well, see a lot of we, the uh, especially if we hear about a budget increase for space <laughs> exploration, that would do it because right. <laughs> that money is going to go directly, you know, to certain companies. And, you know, some of these, uh, like a couple of companies you mentioned, are like defense contractors. That relationship between defense contracting and space exploration. Is uh, pretty close. Yeah. You guys have anything else you want to add? Uh, you want to bring up? Nope. Uh, nothing for me. Anything in the chat? Also, um, I just want to take the time out and say um, we should congratulate ourselves on the um, breaking 200 subscribers. The breaking what? Yeah, we are at 200. Wow, okay. Breaking 200 subscribers. Well, that's uh, oh, nice. congrats to, to, the, to everybody that's uh, participated, contributed to the uh, Black Brain Trust. Uh, thank you for Lionel. To Lionel for uh, you know getting it started, taking that initiative. Uh, thank you for everybody in the chat, everybody that's have been in the chat, and thank you in advance for spreading the word. We're trying to grow this. As I see the Black Brain Trust, it's the way I see it. It's an aspirational effort. It's not saying that we're the smartest guys around. It's saying that collectively as a community. We're pretty smart. And so the platform is for you. 
for all of us to come and uh, share what we know, share our and share our curiosity and learn. That's it. Right. And a uh, shout out to Brother Kirigakuri for, uh, you know, putting my uh, uh, put, putting the, the, the show link uh, in his in his chat and all the guys who came over from there, um, like uh, Abdullahi and JB, Megaton and Faber. It was good seeing you guys here. Welcome. I, I, I think he makes a great, really great point, uh, Faber, um, in the chat. You know, like, um, how many generations of people were living under damn near perpetual sunlight with no pigmentation? Hmm. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess what was good is uh, all those uh, great uh, Egypt, no, no, uh, not great Egypt, but, uh, the, you know, those Egyptian movies that were coming out like a couple of, a couple of years ago, um, Egypt kings and that kind of stuff, just featuring European actors. They bond pretty hard. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, but you know, I see that as a good sign. <laughs> that right. People are like, no, that can't be possible. Right. I mean, did they have sunscreen back then? <laughs> it must be a lot of sunscreen. Yeah. But it, it, they, they have to know it's false because it, you know, any person who's traveled to Egypt who's white has gotten darker by the time they came back with sunscreen or no sunscreen. Right. Right. And, you know, um, I'm looking at the chat, you know, he said, maybe, you know, Jedi focus says maybe they were black aliens. Maybe it was Pookie alien. <laughs> uh, oh, actually, I, I guess I, I have one thing to say um, about uh, the, the, the ancient Egyptians. I think when they say that those pyramids were built by slaves, I, I have a hard time believing that because it was too arduous, um, you know, uh, for people to have been forced to build them. I, I think it was, a, you know, I won't say consensual, but I can't think of a, any other word um, in terms of they wanted to build it for their kings, uh, you know, and such. So I, I don't think they were built by slave labor. Yeah, I've heard that argument too. They said nobody, no, it's too, uh, the precision is too great. And you know somebody working for free is not gonna care that much <laughs> to be that precise. Uh, you know, a slave is not gonna care, you know give you that that. Level Wait, well, I mean, what did, I mean, what they do? Go to like Angelus and get like a contractor to come in and cut these blocks. <laughs> um. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh. But I guess we should give a moment of silence to all the millions and billions of documents that were destroyed <laughs> that could have given us this information. It's exactly. very sad. Exactly. Uh, in particular, um, I believe this was a seven, no. Um, well, when was the Spanish Inquisition? Was it the 1500s? Well, hey, we see. I don't know if you guys know. Google. Off the top of my head, no, but let's, let's Google it. Let's be precise. Okay. But make your point while I'm looking it up. Okay, because uh, during that time when um, uh, the the Spanish, or I should say, Queen Elizabeth and uh, her husband, um, I believe his name is Aragon or Ferdinand, I believe, they when they were taking it over from the Muslims, they burned the libraries of, of Cordoba, uh, or Cordoba as they call it today. Uh, and there was a billion documents in those libraries. Uh, I don't know if it's exactly scrolls or pieces of paper, but a billion of it were, uh, were burned in one year. 14, so, uh, another, 1478 to 1834. Okay, so the burnings were probably in the 1430s. Yeah, that's also a tragic loss that we can't ever get back. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's all I had to say. <laughs> Stop burning libraries, I guess right. is the central argument for that. Right. So 
might. Might. Sorry, I had to get some water. Oh, okay. But I'll, I'll end the broadcast now. Okay. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, tonight um, on a special edition of um, Space and Technology. Um, we'll be back on Monday uh, with another Space and Technology Hangout, uh, episode 71. And Wednesday, uh, what, what's the topic on Wednesday? Geopolitics. Say it again. Geopolitics. Geopolitics. And Friday, every Friday, economics. See ya.